Well, good morning. We're going to go over just a few announcements uh, this morning. So if you'll go to pages two and three of your uh, worship guide, we'll go over those announcements. Just before I do those announcements, just a a special thank you to to all that uh, were here yesterday for Mr. Cole's funeral and everybody that helped and uh, it was just a, it was, it was wonderful. Very glorifying to God. Barry did an excellent, excellent job and, and Craig spoke and Marlon sang and just, it was, it was great. So uh, just thank you for everyone uh, that was involved uh, with that. Well, I'm on page two, and so page two is uh, mostly directed to our guests. So if you're a guest with us this morning, we want to just uh, say, hey, we're great that it's great that you're here. Uh, And uh, please read through those and know that we do typically have a 20 to a 30 minute break in between our, uh, our service and our Sunday school time. So please feel free to, to join us and for coffee and juice and donuts in our fellowship hall, which is outside these uh, double doors here. You can also get, get to it through the hallway in the back there. And then moving on to page three, we have our adult Sunday school classes as usual. Uh, this Friday night, you'll see on the calendar there, there's a singles game night at 7 p.m. here at the church. Uh, We will have a members meeting uh, after Sunday school that will be next Sunday. So immediately after the Sunday school hour, we'll we'll have a members meeting. And then April the 27th is a church work day at 8 a.m. And April the 28th, a vacation Bible school meeting uh, also after the Sunday school hour on that day. So uh, Mark... Those things on your calendar, you'll see some things coming up in June as well. June 1st is our spring seminar. Uh, Jim Hamilton will be here with us, so we look forward to that. Mark that on your calendar and register uh, on the church website for that as well. And then you'll see uh, the uh, information on the youth camp there. If you are planning to go to youth camp, uh, please let Sean Petty know as soon as possible and and you can see there the dates of your payments. And if you are needing help with those payments, there are scholarships available. So please see uh, Sean Petty uh, if you're gonna, if you're interested in youth camp. Uh, any other uh, announcements uh, this morning, perhaps that I've missed or don't know about? Okay, well, great. Then the ensemble has another. Uh, song. They're going to be on uh, in the hymnal on 153 if you do want to follow along or sing along as we uh, continue to prepare our hearts uh, for worship this morning. Thank you. 
for those who will draw near. Acceptance, forgiveness, and a love that conquers Well, good morning. Welcome to Providence Baptist Church on this Lord's Day. We do have the privilege of starting our service this morning with a testimony followed by believers' baptism. This is Jonathan Mitchell. He's grown up in this church. And he's going to share with you this morning what the Lord uh, has been doing in his life. Good morning. I was born and raised in a Christian home. My story does not differ much from many others who had a Christian upbringing. I went to church because my parents made me. I memorized catechism for the approval of my teachers. Overall, I wanted nothing to do with God. The whole religion thing felt like a distraction. A few years ago, God convicted me of my sins. He had melted my heart of stone and forced me to cry out to him. I began to believe that the Father sent his Son to die for my selfish transgressions. The message began resonating with me and changing the way I thought and acted. However, in this newfound freedom, I still managed to corrupt the wonderful gift that God had sent. I saw myself as superior, thankful that I was not like other, more foolish people my age. My eyes drifted away from God and back to myself. Around Easter of last year, I was sent into a spiral of doubt. Not just of my faith, but the very existence of the Father himself. I vividly remember how my life got turned upside down. I couldn't recognize myself. I once thought I was someone who did everything for God's glory and had his divine approval, but now I could not even believe that he was real. Along with this doubt came a horrible wave of fear. God showed me then the reason for this trial. I was a very weak, very helpless being in need of a savior. God displayed his everlasting love for me on the cross. He took all my sin and all my guilt and nailed them to a tree along with himself and died. After that, he rose on the third day. Christ washed away all my sin with his blood, so that I may come to worship and praise the Almighty God. The dead I owe remains beyond description. I long to live the rest of eternity for the glory of God. Even though I still have struggles, Christ gave me a hope that is stronger than any fear, and the Lord has given me an unfailing promise of eternal life. Before I conclude, it would be selfish of me not to mention my brother Nathan, who helped talk to me even in the worst of times. I also want to thank the rest of my family who helped calm me down when I was most fearful. Romans 1.16 says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. It's the hymn, Christ the sure and steady anchor says, Christ the sure and steady anchor, in the fury of the storm, when the winds of doubt blow through me and my sails have all been torn, in the suffering and the sorrow when my sinking hopes are few, I will hold fast to the anchor, it shall never be removed. Glory be to God. Jonathan, upon your public profession of faith in our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, I baptize you, my brother, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Well, amen. As Jonathan said, all glory be to God. Praise the Lord for his work in our lives. And uh, as most of you know, uh, you'll have uh, about a month's time. Uh, if you have any questions for Jonathan, uh, you know, go to him, ask him, talk to him about his uh, testimony. And after that four months' time, uh, he, uh, if there's no... Uh, uh, no issues that uh, we know about. He will become a member here at, at Providence uh, Baptist. So, praise the Lord for that. Well, I'm going to read just a couple verses from Psalm 100 to begin this morning. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into His presence with singing. 
Well, let's do that this morning. Let's turn to page six in our worship guides. Turn to page six and stand with me as we are going to make a joyful noise to the Lord and give thanks and serve the Lord with gladness and come into his presence with singing. Let's shout for joy uh, together this morning. Oh, shout for joy. Oh, shout for joy unto the Lord. Worship him with gladness. Let all the earth bring songs of praise to being seated, turn to 1 Chronicles with me, book of 1 Chronicles, chapter 16, First Chronicles chapter 16, they're bringing the ark back into Jerusalem, and there is great uh, joy and praise in Jerusalem from the Israelites at this time, and David appoints uh, some of the men there to lead in in song and worship, and so I'm going to begin right in the middle of that song in verse 23. So 1 Chronicles 16 I'm going to begin at verse 23. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Tell of his salvation from day to day. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous works among all the peoples. For great is the Lord and greatly to be praised, and he is to be feared above all gods. For all the gods of the peoples are worthless idols. But the Lord made the heavens. Splendor and majesty are before him. Strength and joy are in his place. Ascribe to the Lord, O families of the peoples. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Bring an offering and come before him. Worship the Lord in the splendor of holiness. 
Tremble before him, all the earth. Yes, the world is established. It shall never be moved. Let the heavens be glad, and let the earth rejoice, and let them say among the nations, The Lord reigns. Let the sea roar and all that fills it. Let the field exult and everything in it. Then shall the trees of the forest sing for joy before the Lord, for he comes to judge the earth. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. And I'm going to skip down to 36, if you would, skip down to 36 with me. Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, from everlasting to everlasting. And then all the people said, and praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Let us pray this morning. Oh God in heaven, we do praise you. We thank you and we praise you. We praise you for the trees and the forests. We praise you for the fields and the seas. We praise you for the heavens, for all of your creation, oh God. We praise you. Lord, we praise you for your holiness. We praise you for your strength. We praise you for your splendor and your majesty. Oh God, we praise you for your marvelous deeds. Oh God, help us to remember your marvelous deeds in your word. And how it is that it relates to you as we sin against you. For Father, we come to you this morning, we ask for mercy. According to your love, Father, wipe away, blot out our transgression. By your Spirit, we know our sins are before us in our minds, in our understanding. Not only have we sinned against our friends, our family, our our neighbors, but we've primarily sinned against you. You delight in the truth, and so we come to you truthfully. Lord, our hearts deceive us at times, our minds are thinking we're just fine, that we're better than we truly are, you know, and we come to you and plead with you to purge us, to cleanse us, to wash us. Restore that which the locusts have eaten, that which the sin and the guilt has eaten away. And Father, create in us a clean heart, a pure spirit, We thank you that your spirit is ever abiding and you'll not cast us away. We pray, Father, for the joy to return as we turn from our sin. Confess to you. Plead on the basis not of what we've done, but upon your mercy. Restore to us the joy of the salvation that you have given to us as a free gift. We ask these things in Jesus' name, that our guilt might be removed and that the joy might come again and you might be honored. 
as a God of steadfast love. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So that's Old Testament. Is there a new covenant, a New Testament assurance that uh, not only was David forgiven, but we can be forgiven also. In Romans 8, verses 1 and 2, Paul says there's no condemnation. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of sin, the law of the spirit of life has set you free from the law of sin and death. Praise his holy name for his grace. Now we'll sing a couple more songs before Corey comes with our message this morning. So turn to 209. 209 in your hymnals. And we're going to sing and encourage each other and remind each other that it's not the labors of our hands that work salvation for us. It's only by the Lord Jesus Christ. It's only faith in him. It's only because of what he did, not because of how great any of us are, but it's because of how great the Lord Jesus Christ is. So let's uh, stand together and sing Rock of Ages. Let's go to 91. And sing our hymn of the month, The Love of God. Let's sing together. Just 
So if you were here yesterday for Mr. Cole's funeral, that was the song we, the last, the final song we sang. Um, several weeks back, I mentioned to Diane that I wanted to possibly um, have that as our hymn of the month, and her words were, among some other men, she said, Mr. Cole will love that. And um, as Barry was with him last Sunday, watching the service, um, he said that Mr. Cole, who kind of in and out of it, mostly out for the most part, but whenever that song was sang, that he was, was humming along, singing as best he could, and then for the rest of the day, at least for several hours, he was humming that song. So, um, God's providence, that that's our hymn of the month. Um, it was not, I, I wasn't us that did that. Um, I choose songs based on what I find and things that it's probably reading a book and heard about that song. I thought, oh, this would be a good song to sing. But the Lord had other plans there and showed us just his loving kindness, his love for Mr. Cole um, in that. So beautiful song. We've got a couple more weeks to sing it and uh, just think about God's love. But this morning we'll be in Genesis chapter 42. Um, last week we looked at the first 20 verses of this chapter, and we saw Joseph's brothers, they go down to Egypt to buy grain. There's a severe famine, if you recall, um, and as they go down to Egypt, they're standing before Joseph. They don't recognize him. Joseph recognizes them, and it's a strange encounter um, as we're reading it. We know that Joseph knows his brothers. The brothers don't know him, um, but he accuses them of being spies, says, you're coming to spy out the nakedness of the land. They refute the charge. They tell him, we are honest men, sons of one man. One brother is at home with our father, and one is no more. At least that's what they thought, and they'll continue to think that for a little while. But Joseph, he was insistent that they are spies, and so he places a test upon them. He's going to test their integrity um, he tells them, essentially, one man, one brother will, will stay behind. Nine of you will now go back home and bring your brother back to Joseph in Egypt to bring their youngest brother back to Egypt. According to Joseph, this will prove whether there's truth in these men, whether they are honest men. So in the second half of Genesis 42, um, which is where we'll be this morning, we're going to see Joseph's brothers return to Egypt, or to, I mean, sorry, return to Canaan, returning to their father, 
trying to persuade him to let Benjamin, their youngest brother, return with them to Egypt. Piece of cake, right? All they have to do is go and say, hey, we just need to take our brother back. No big deal. All they have to do is bring him back. But if you recall from last week, Jacob did not send Benjamin with his brothers because he feared that harm might come to him. He sent the rest of the brother, the rest of his sons to Egypt. And now here, nine out of ten are coming back, really probably reminding him that he made the right decision. He didn't send Benjamin because he didn't want anything to happen to Benjamin, his beloved son. And now all of a sudden he sent ten and nine are coming back justifies why he did what he did. So now they have to persuade him to send Benjamin back. So our passage is going to be Genesis 42, 21 through 38. I'm going to go ahead and read it at this time, and then we'll pray. So verse 21 of Genesis 42. Then they said to one another, in truth, we are guilty concerning our brother, In that we saw the distress of his soul when he begged us and we did not listen. That is why this distress has come upon us. And Reuben answered them, Did I not tell you not to sin against the boy? But you did not listen? So now there comes a reckoning for his blood. They did not know that Joseph understood them, for there was an interpreter between them. Then he turned away from them and wept, and he returned to them and spoke to them. And he took Simeon from them and bound him before their eyes, and Joseph gave orders to fill their bags with grain and to replace every man's money in his sack and to give them provisions for the journey. This was done for them. Then they loaded their donkeys with their grain and departed. And as one of them opened his sack to give his donkey fodder at the lodging place, he saw his money in the mouth of his sack. He said to his brothers, my money has been put back. Here it is in the mouth of my sack. At this, their hearts failed them. And they turned trembling to one another saying, what is this that God has done to us? When they came to Jacob, their father in the land of Canaan, they told him all that had happened to them saying, The man, the Lord of the land, spoke roughly to us and took us to be spies of the land. But we said to him, we are honest men. We have never been spies. We are 12 brothers, sons of our father. One is no more, and the youngest is this day with our father in the land of Canaan. Then the man, the Lord of the land, said to us, by this I shall know that you are honest men. Leave one of your brothers with me and take grain for the famine of your households and go on your way. Bring your youngest brother to me. Then I shall know that you are not spies, but honest men. And I will deliver your brother to you and you shall trade in this land. As they emptied their sacks, behold, every man's bundle of money was in his sack. And when they and their father saw their bundles of money, they were afraid. And Jacob, their father said to them, You have bereaved me of my children. Joseph is no more, and Simeon is no more, and now you would take Benjamin? All this has come against me. Then Reuben said to his father, Kill my two sons if I do not bring him back to you. Put him in my hands, and I will bring him back to you. But he said, My son shall not go down with you, for his brother is dead, and he is the only one left. If harm should happen to him on the journey that you are to make, you would bring down my gray hairs with sorrow to Sheol. This is the word of the Lord. Let us pray. Oh, Heavenly Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus Christ, and we pray that your Spirit will lead and guide us this day. You know that we come with heavy hearts this morning as we grieve the passing of our beloved saint and friend, Mr. Cole. But we also have thankful hearts, for it has been a privilege to know him. Some of us have known him longer than others, but it has been a privilege to know him and to experience a taste of your love and kindness through him. 
Thank you for providing us with this example of a life well lived. Of a man who desired to gather with the saints, but was providentially hindered these past few years. But oh, how he longed to be in your house. And now he is in the eternal house, the eternal banquet, feasting at that eternal banquet. And I pray that you would help us to live faithful lives, to endure to the end as you have preserved him. You are faithful to your promises, O God. You have begun a good work in us and surely you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. And on this day, this Lord's Day, we not only rejoice in your faithfulness at bringing one of your beloved children to the finish line, but we also rejoice as we've heard the testimony of one who has begun the race. We've heard the testimony of one who you have saved. Who grew up hearing your truth and now has been converted by the power of your spirit working in him through your word. You've brought new life. I thank you for your love and kindness as you continue to draw sinners to yourself. You are an amazing God. We have sung about your greatness. We've sung your praises and I pray that our hearts would mean what we have said this day. And also pray that you would remind us of your greatness through the preaching of your word. Give every one of us ears to hear what you would have for us this day. I pray this in Christ's name. Amen. So you might have picked up on this when we read, but our passage this morning takes place in three locations. It begins in Egypt Then we see their journey home and then concludes in Canaan. So in verses 21 through 25, I believe there's an outline in your worship guide where you can see these things. But in verses 21 through 25, we see the conclusion of their first trip to Egypt, which began back in verse 6. And here, Joseph's brothers, they're overcome with a sense of their guilt. The guilt for something that happened 20 years back. After this, the passage transitions to their journey home. In verses 26 through 28, uh, we see them journeying home, and as one of the brothers opens up his sack, sees their money has been put back, and they all tremble with fear. And then the chapter concludes, verses 29 through 38, they've made it back to Canaan to their father. Joseph tells them, he will, I mean, sorry, Jacob tells them, and remember, I'll get those names confused. Um, So just you know what I mean. Jacob, father, Joseph in Egypt. Um, So Jacob tells them he will not send Benjamin back to Egypt. He will not lose another son. I mean, imagine the sons hearing that saying, Benjamin's the only one left. Well, here's the other brothers. What about me? Um, You can see his favoritism right there. But he won't lose another son, and so here, there, in this section, we see more fear accompanied by sorrow. So as we walk through this passage, we're going to see guilt. We'll see self-righteousness. We'll see fear. We'll see self-pity. But in the midst of it all, as we consider all of Scripture, because this is not where the Bible ends, as we consider God's Word, we'll also be reminded of God's goodness. Just think about Jacob. He's been a recipient of God's blessing. He knows God's covenant promises, yet he seems to have forgotten the goodness of God. In verse 36, 
He says, all this has come against me. Down in verse 38, he says, if something happens to Benjamin, that you would bring down my gray hairs with sorrow to Sheol. So he would die. He's saying he will die from great sorrow and anguish. Jacob is really hanging on to the things of this world too closely, particularly his youngest son. And remember, this is not a child. This would be a grown man. Jacob is not like the woman who was, one of her sons was killed in the time of persecution. She heard the report. She asked, which son was it that died? And when she was told it was her oldest son, she said, God be thanked. He was the fittest to die. My other children will have some more time for preparation, and they needed it more than their brother. Unlike this lady, Jacob is too earthly minded, too self focused, not trusting in God's providence. From the looks of it, he seems to be, have been grief stricken for the past 20 years, seemingly forgotten the promises of God. I don't say that to minimize the reality of grief and affliction, but really to point out that self-pity and sorrow, a life of self-pity, a life of sorrow, can really paralyze us. Instead of doing what's best for his family, he doesn't want to do anything. And the consequences of such an action, what will they be? Death for the entire family. Remember, Severe famine. They don't get food. They'll all die in just merely a matter of time. So with that in mind, let's turn our attention here to verses 21 through 25, where we see the conclusion of their trip to Egypt. If you recall, so we're coming right in the middle of a conversation of, of, of an event that's happening. They've been placed into custody for three days. On the third day, they were let out. Joseph has amended the prior arrangement. Previously, it was um, one of you go, nine of you stay. Now it's nine of you go, one of you stay. And here in verse 21, we see the brother's reaction to this present dilemma. The situation has stirred up guilty feelings within them. And so they say to one another in verse 21, in truth, we are guilty concerning our brother. And that we saw the distress of his soul when he begged us and we did not listen. That is why this distress has come upon us. So as you know, many of you know, the brothers are referring to Joseph. When they threw him into that pit back in chapter 37. Then they subsequently sold him to slave traders. They were going to kill him. Then they had the idea, why don't we make money off of him? But you can just imagine here, we didn't see there that there was distress in Joseph. We, we, we could feel it though, but now we're told this great distress was upon him, that he was in that pit begging for them. But what did they do? They didn't listen. And now after 20 years, it's been at least 20 years, they declare their guilt concerning their brother. They're going through this period of suffering. I mean, they are being afflicted. They're suffering. They've been accused of being spies. They've been imprisoned. And now this guilt is being stirred up within them. They recognize their guilt. They confess their guilt. They are guilty. They always have been guilty. And here they're confessing their guilt to one another. Now, when we think about guilt and awareness of guilt, it's helpful for us to remember this, that guilt and awareness of guilt are not the same thing. I'm going to quote a Dutch theologian named Herman Bovink. He, uh, he wrote this, The character of sin is not defined by the subjective consciousness of guilt. The standard of sin is not the consciousness of guilt, but the law of God. So think about that. The standard of sin is the law of God. That's where we learn sin. So Bovink reminds us here, and, and what he was doing is he's saying that we can be guilty, yet not be aware of our guilt. He goes on to write, guilt and consciousness of guilt are not the same. There are sins that are hidden from ourselves and others, and the sins of ignorance are still culpable. Now, I'm not saying Joseph and his brothers are ignorant of their their sin, but I'm just trying to, to help you consider the full picture of Scripture. So just think about the testimony of Scripture. For instance, Paul, 
standing before the Areopagus, he says this, the times of ignorance God overlooked, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent. And then Paul in 1 Timothy 1, he speaks of acting ignorantly in unbelief. And then there's David who cried out for God to declare him innocent from hidden faults. Have Joseph's brothers been so hardened in their sin that they didn't think they were guilty prior to this? Probably not. I mean, after all, they they did cover up what, what happened to their father. And I imagine they've been trying to suppress this ever since. But here they are. They're aware of their guilt, and their awareness is correct. And to quote Bavink again, the human conscience is the subjective proof of humanity's fall, a witness of human guilt before the face of God. God is not the only accuser of humankind. In their conscience, humans condemn themselves and take God's side against themselves. So while they've been guilty the whole time, Joseph's brothers are now burdened with guilt. Their conscience is accusing them, and they're overwhelmed by this guilt. They're in this time of trouble, and they're saying, we are guilty. That's why this is coming upon us. We are guilty. He begged us. We did not listen. They've been guilty the whole time, and and regardless, if they were ignorant of it, I don't think they were, but if they were suppressing it, which is probably true, they've been guilty the whole time, and here they are 20 years later. This guilt is being stirred up. Didn't go away. And this burden of guilt, it reminds me of Martin Luther. Martin Luther lived a long time under such a heavy sense of guilt. He understood that he was a sinner before the Lord, and he tried to do all he could to placate the wrath of God. But the more he did, the greater was his state of despair. And if not for the amazing grace of God, Luther would have remained that way. You see, if not for Christ's righteousness being credited to us through faith, we would all remain in the guilt and pollution of our sin because we are all guilty sinners. Whether we acknowledge that or not, whether we try to suppress that or not, we are all guilty sinners before the Lord. Not one of us will stand before the Lord and say, you know what? I did all of this in your name. Save me. No. You're not going to stand and say, you know what? I was better than that guy or that lady. Let me in. We are guilty sinners before the Lord. Thank God for the righteousness of Christ. Luther expounding on the truth that man does not merit God's righteousness, but that it is the grace of God that imputes Christ's righteousness to sinners through faith. This is what he writes. Christ gives us righteousness, life, and salvation Not through our works, but through his own works, death and suffering. In order that we may avail ourselves of his death and victory as though we had done it ourselves. So whereas Luther once viewed God as a terrible and angry judge, he discovered a gracious God who pardons sinners, not through their own works, but through the works of Christ. Apart from the grace of God poured out in Jesus Christ, when we recognize our guilt, we ought to tremble with fear. You ought to tremble with fear whether you recognize it or not because you're guilty. And that's what we're going to see with Joseph's brothers in a moment as they will tremble with fear. And the reason we ought to tremble with fear is because God is a consuming fire. We've already seen a glimpse of his wrath in the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, in the floodwaters of judgment in the days of Noah. And so, as I'll come back to in a little bit, these brothers probably know of these very realities, these historical truths. And here they are realizing they're guilty. And then their brother Reuben comes along in verse 22, and he says... 
I told you so. Look, Reuben answered them, did I not tell you not to sin against the boy, but you did not listen? So now there comes a reckoning for his blood. This is true. He did try to prevent his brothers from killing Joseph. You can go back to chapter 37 and read about that. But it's also true that Reuben took part in covering up what happened. If you recall, none of the brothers came clean to, Joseph, or to Jacob. So while Reuben did seek to spare Joseph's life, he was gone when they sold him into slavery. He didn't come clean to their father and tell him the truth. Instead, he took part in the cover-up. So while there's some truth, there is truth here to what Reuben says. I mean, he, he did tell them not to kill him. There is a reckoning coming for his blood. But this is more of an I told you so than a helpful exhortation. If Reuben was a man of integrity, he would have come clean to his father. No matter the fallout with his brothers, if he was truly an honorable man, at the end of this passage, he's not going to offer to sacrifice his two sons. Besides, Reuben is the son who took his father's concubine back in chapter 35. Now, that doesn't mean he hasn't matured since then, because he probably has. But more than anything, this reminds us, this is a destitute band of brothers, and Reuben is just as destitute as the rest. But here we see his self-righteousness in the form of, I told you so. On a side note, I told you so is rarely helpful. Don't get me wrong. There's a time and a place for it. Don't get me wrong. But it's often wielded out of pride and self-righteous indignation. I mean, I don't know about you, but I always want to say I told you so whenever I'm right. But oftentimes we do it out of pride. Or because maybe we did something together, I said no, but I went along with it anyways, and now I want to say I told you so to be less culpable. That's Reuben. We're a lot more, you know, whenever we read Scripture, we're a lot more like the people we don't want to be like than the ones we do want to be like. Reuben, he isn't seeking to encourage or exhort his brothers. He's seeking to lessen his guilt. He's guilty, but he told them not to do this. Therefore, in his mind, he's not as bad as his brothers. He tried to warn them. I might remind you of Romans 2. I might want to read that later on and think about that. Romans 1 and 2. So what we have here in verses 21 and 22, we see Joseph's brothers, they're in a state of anguish. They declare their guilty status. And all the while, Joseph, he heard them speaking. They didn't know that he understood them. Remember, they don't know who he is. He's been using an interpreter. And so when he heard these things in verse 24, we see that he turned away from them and he wept. We'll come back more to his, his emotions in, in weeks to come, but we see him move to tears. I mean, these tears are probably full of emotion. As the brother's remorse, they, they, they've seen the, they, he's seen this, and that probably even takes him back to that fateful day when they sold him into slavery. But although he has moved to tears, he's not going to change course. For as we see in the rest of verse 24, he takes Simeon, and then he binds him before their eyes. We don't know why Simeon was chosen. We can only speculate, and that'd be futile to do so. But he's the brother who will remain in their stead. And just to show the seriousness of the, this matter, Joseph takes him and bound him before them. And now the other nine, they'll return home. While Simeon will remain here in custody, and the only way for him to be set free is for the brothers to bring back Benjamin, their youngest brother. But before Joseph will send them away, we see in verse 25, he gives orders to his men to fill their bags with grain, to replace their money in their sacks, and to give them provisions for the journey. And that sets us up for the journey home. So we've seen here the brothers' remorse over the wrongs they did to Joseph. This really is an illustration of sin's guilt. 
This guilt has been hanging over their heads for 20 years. They're guilty. Time has not removed that guilt. And as we progress throughout the Joseph narrative, their guilt will continue to loom large. That's why guilt must be dealt with. And thank God that in Christ Jesus, our guilt is removed. Otherwise, we'd be the ones paying for that. And we would spend all eternity to do so. And so the only reason our guilt is removed is because Jesus Christ bore our guilt upon the cross. He was condemned in our place. Don't ever forget that truth. Don't ever forget the sweetness of the blood of Christ, the bitter sweetness. Death came to him that we might have life. So now that we come to, the, to their journey home, the brothers, their sense of guilt will be amplified as fear of divine retribution. As they're on their way home, they stop at a lodging place. One of the brothers opens his sack to feed his donkey. He notices that his money is placed back in the top of his sack. So in verse 28, he tells them, my money has been put back. Here it is in the mouth of my sack. And while we know that Joseph's the one who did this, they don't know this. They don't know. So as they see their money, we see here their hearts failed them. Their hearts sank. If there was any confidence left in these men, it's gone. It's deflated. They are burdened by guilt. They've been accused of espionage, of being spies. One of their brothers is in prison. They have to convince their dad to let his beloved Benjamin go back to Egypt, and now they are thieves on the run. As if things couldn't get any worse, here's one more obstacle. They've already been accused of being dishonest men, and now that their money's back in their sacks, they'll be accused of being thieves. There won't be any accounting for their payment. As such, their hearts sank. They trembled, as we see in verse 28, and they said, what is this that God has done to us? They don't have the background that we do. They don't know that Joseph gave them food for their journey. They don't know that he gave them grain to take home for no price. They don't realize that. As James Montgomery Boyce, he was, he's the late pastor of 10th Presbyterian Church, he said this, there is nothing in this story to make us think that Joseph's intentions were anything other than absolutely kind. So if we take it from that standpoint, if we agree with Boyce, then this is good providence. They have grain for their family that they didn't have to buy. They didn't have to stop at Bucky's and spend food for the journey home, to spend money on food. Now, I know some people are thinking, well, it'd have been good to stop at Bucky's. That's what we always want to go to. But they didn't have to spend money there. On a side note, and I had debated where I was going to say this. On a side note, when I was in Kansas City a few years back, they thought, all these guys thought I was crazy when I was talking to them about Bucky's. So, just so you know. Um, anyways, they couldn't believe. I was telling them Walmart, but yet bathrooms and all of that. Anyways, <laughs> but think about it. They have food. They don't have to pay for food on the way home. This is good provision. They, they have been given good things for no cost. But from their perspective, what is good? They receive with fear of divine judgment. Because of their sin, this good provision heaps burning coals on their heads. They are overcome with fear that God has brought all of this upon them. And in all reality, he has. God has ordained it all. But while God is actually providing for them through Joseph, they are overcome with fear. Because of their sin, they are interpreting good providence as divine judgment. I mean, just think about these brothers. I mean, think who their dad is, Jacob, who his dad was, uh, you know, Isaac, and then Abraham. Think about all that he, they would have learned. They would have grown up being taught the Bible stories that we know. They would have heard about the exile from the garden. 
They would have heard about the floodwaters of judgment. They would have heard about the dispersion of the people at Babel. They would have heard about the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. It's likely that Jacob catechized his kids to use our nomenclature, that he taught them about God's righteous judgment. And here they are wrestling with it all. And they're interpreting these events as God's reckoning. When in all reality, God is providing for them here. He is preserving their lives. So as they return home from Egypt, they are beneficiaries of God's gracious provision. But they see this as God's judgment upon them. Their guilt, their fear is similar to those spoken of in Leviticus 26. In Leviticus 26, 36, we read, For those who are guilty of breaking God's law, God says the sound of a driven leaf shall put them to flight. The sound of a leaf blowing in the wind will put them to flight. And they shall flee as one flees from the sword, and they shall fall when no one pursues. That's what these brothers are experiencing. There is such a fear of divine retribution among these brothers that they interpret God's good providence as God's judgment. And we'll see this again when they return to Egypt. They'll be invited to have lunch with Joseph. Yet they'll be fearful. And they're going to say, essentially, he's only inviting us to enslave us and take our donkeys. They are fearful of God's judgment, and rightly so. But know this. For all who call upon the name of the Lord, there is no pending judgment coming your way. For those who call upon the name of the Lord, you have been saved from God's righteous judgment. Now, there may be some of you here today, children of God, who call upon the name of the Lord, yet live in constant fear of God's punishment. But remember, If you are God's child, he is not out to punish you. He is a kind and merciful father who is generous and good. Now, don't hear me wrong. God disciplines his children. But there is a difference between parental discipline and judicial punishment. For those who are in Christ, there is no fear, no threat of hellfire or eternal condemnation. You've been delivered from the wrath of God. And by the amazing grace of God, there is nothing you can do if you're in Christ. There's nothing you can do to earn or merit eternal damnation. But that doesn't mean you've been set free to sin. We've been set free from the bondage of sin and from its punishment. So while God's children have been saved from judicial punishment, Because we've been adopted as sons in Jesus Christ, our Lord, it is true that our Heavenly Father disciplines us because He cares for us. I heard Craig a a while, years back, teaching a um, shepherding a child's heart class, and he asked whose parents disciplined them, who, who used the rod, and the response was, your parents loved you. God disciplines those whom He loves. It's painful in the moment, yes, but it's because He loves you. In the words of the Scottish Presbyterian John Cahoon, you'll probably hear me quote him in weeks to come, even more, did last week, but he says this, in order to deter believers from disobedience, as well as to promote in them the mortification of sin, the Lord threatens that, although He will not cast them into hell for their sins, yet He will permit hell, as it were, to enter their consciences. So think about that. He's saying they will not be cast into hell, but they'll be disciplined. And he he just uses this language of permitting hell, as it were, to enter your conscience. And according to him, this is how God disciplines us. Through outward affliction, deprivation of communion with God, bitterness instead of sweetness, and terror instead of comfort. 
And he says these chastisements, so these disciplines, are to a believer more forcible restraints from sin than even the prospect of vindictive wrath would be. For instance, for the believer, and I think you can see this in the life of David. For the believer, the threat of divine communion being taken away tempers our lust more than the threat of eternal hellfire. So just the very prospect of us, of God withdrawing from us, that communion that we have with him through the word, through prayer, through one another, that communion being withdrawn ought to temper our lusts more than the threat of eternal hellfire. Because once you have tasted and seen that the Lord is good, there's nothing worse than his blessed presence being withdrawn from you for a season. So for the believer, there is no threat of eternal punishment. Believers are disciplined, yes. But there's no threat of judicial punishment. The same cannot be said for the non-believer. Keep that in mind. So as we return to Joseph's brothers, they're experiencing the torments of hell. As Joseph where really God, through Joseph, has provided food for them without price. They are tormented by such good provision because of their guilt. And now as they return to Canaan, they'll try to persuade Jacob to let Benjamin go back with them. In verses 29 through 34, I'm not going to go back through that, but this is just a retelling of what's already happened, of the events that have happened that we considered last week and read through earlier. So they tell him about all that transpired. And after this, we see in verse 35 that they empty their sacks and they see that their money is there. And when they and their father saw their bundles of money, they were afraid. All of them were afraid. And in response, we'll see Jacob wallow in self-pity. Verse 36, Jacob, their father, said to them, you've bereaved me of my children. Joseph is no more. Simeon is no more. And now you would take Benjamin? All this has come against me. He counts his losses. Joseph's gone. Simeon's gone. And now you want to take Benjamin and take him from me? He places the burden of guilt on his sons who are standing before him. He blames them for bereaving him of his children. He doesn't take ownership for his partiality, for his favoritism. He doesn't take ownership for perhaps his negligence to what's been taking place within his household. And he lays all the blame on his sons and says, all this has come against me. At this point in time, Jacob is a far cry from the lady I mentioned earlier who trusted the Lord's providence even in the death of her son. She recognized the need for her remaining sons to prepare for their death. And so in contrast to her, Jacob is saying, everything's against me. Woe is me. James Boyce said, if he had known our little song for children, Jesus loves me, he might have sung it this way. No one loves me, this I know. My misfortunes tell me so. Jacob's short-sighted. I I don't want to stand and say that his misfortunes aren't bad. His circumstances are not good. He's had a rough go. He lost his favorite wife, Rachel, his favorite son, Joseph, his son, Simeon, being held captive in Egypt. His other sons now want to take his beloved Benjamin down to Egypt. On top of that, if he doesn't do anything, they'll die of starvation from this famine. So it's not a not a great, the circumstances aren't good, but if we step back and look at the big picture, we're reminded that Jacob has been the recipient of God's blessing. He's been the recipient of blessing upon blessing. God's eternal covenant promises have been extended to him. Jacob has prospered greatly in the land of promise. He's multiplied in a way that his father and his grandfather did not. And not only that, Jacob has seen God face to face, and he lived. Jacob seems to have forgotten the promises of God. He seems to have forgotten the blessings of God. 
And all that he can see is what's right here in front of him. He needs a preacher. He needs someone who will confront him. Someone who will remind him that God is working all things together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. But instead of a preacher, he gets Reuben. Look, look what he says. Verse 37, this is what Jacob gets. He's already loathing in self-pity. Woe is me. And this is what his son tells him. Kill my two sons if I do not bring him back to you. Put him in my hands and I'll bring him back to you. (laughs) Think about it. Reuben sidesteps his own life. Offers up his two sons, so Jacob's grandsons. And says, if we've got to go back, I'll take him back. If we don't make it back, if Benjamin doesn't make it alive, you can have my two grandsons slay them. This provides no comfort for Jacob. And it shouldn't. I mean, I'm sure grandparents out here, you know, this, this is not going to comfort you. This is, the, this is actually going to do the opposite of that. And so, he continues in grief and sorrow. Verse 38 Jacob says, my son shall not go down with you, for his brother is dead and he is the only one left. If harm should happen to him on the journey that you are to make, you would bring down my gray hairs with sorrow to Sheol. So that settles the matter. Jacob will not allow Benjamin to go down to Egypt, and his reason is the sorrow that will come his way. You'll send me to the grave If something happens, and that's where the chapter ends. Jacob's sons, they go down to Egypt. They're accused of espionage. They've been sent back to retrieve Benjamin, but Jacob will not budge. Just imagine if the book of Genesis ended here. The covenant promises would seemingly come to an end. If this is where the narrative concluded, It would seem as though God has given up on Jacob, turned his face away from him. If the narrative stopped here, there'd be no hope. Jacob and his sons, they would die of starvation. The brothers, they would die guilty and without hope of reconciliation. And Jacob would die in his grief and sorrow. But as we know, this is not where the book of Genesis ends. And this is not where the Bible ends. The promises of God, they do remain. And God will work all things according to the counsel of his will. And through Jacob's offspring, a redeemer will come who will bear the guilt of his people. He will become like one who is guilty. He is not guilty inherently, but he will take the guilt of his people upon himself. And he'll be punished as one who is guilty. Isaiah speaks of him saying, it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. This one, this descendant of Jacob, will make a guilt offering for his people and he will be crushed. He'll bear the sins of many. And he will make intercession for the transgressors. And now, in him, in Jesus Christ, who is him, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, it's in him that we have hope. It's in him that every tear will be wiped away. It's in him that our guilt and punishment will be taken away. And this is such good news for us. We, I, I hope and pray that you don't get over how good of news this is. This is such good news for us because like Joseph's brothers, we're guilty before the Lord, the almighty maker of heaven and earth. And whether you realize it or not, outside of Christ, you are guilty. You failed to honor God as God. You failed to give proper thanks to God. You've exchanged the truth about God for a lie. That's why you hold on to this world so tightly. You're like Jacob. You don't want to lose your grip on what you think is yours. You love the world and its goods. You don't love God. 
You might think you do. But fortunately for us all, God is kind. He's long-suffering. He draws sinners to himself. Now, some of your problem, some of you here, your problem probably is this. You don't see yourself as a sinner. You think you're in good standing. You don't think you're a sinner. You don't think you have real guilt. You look at the person next to you and say, you know what? I'm much better off than him. Much better off than her. If that's you, that is a very dangerous posture to take. Because no one is righteous. No, not one. Outside of Christ, we all stand condemned Self-righteousness is a killer. It's deadly because Jesus came to save sinners, not the righteous. But there might be others here this morning who are experiencing the weight of guilt for the sins you've committed. That is you, I plead with you, run to Christ. I pray that this this weight, this burden that you're experiencing is the hound of heaven who will not let you go and that he's bringing you to your knees so that you will realize that there is no hope apart from Jesus Christ. For it's by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, that all our guilt is removed. And since our guilt is removed in him, we no longer stand condemned. The penalty has been paid, and now by grace, through faith, we've been declared righteous. Christ's merit has been applied to us. He's gone before us, done what we could not do, and now we no longer stand condemned. That's why Romans 8.1 is such a beautiful verse of Scripture. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Guilt is gone. It's removed. God declares that you're not guilty. Because you're not guilty, you've been released from the prison cell. And now you will stand guiltless before his throne. Because of Christ, we have hope in life and in death. We have hope knowing that all God's ways are good. And we can enjoy his goodness rather than live in terror of judgment. You know, all throughout Scripture, there are reminders of God's goodness. And as we look around in the church, as we look around in Christ's church, we have frequent reminders of God's goodness. There are so many testimonies of God's grace here. We heard one this morning, and we've heard many over the years We know there's only one way to the Father. That's Jesus Christ. I've heard Tommy say it probably in better words than this, but there are many ways to Christ. He brings us in many ways to Christ, even though there's one way to the Father. If not for the grace of God, not one of us would be here today. There's no no telling how far astray you would have wandered. But apart from God's grace... You would not be here. You see, the problem for Jacob was that he was surrounded by wicked men. He was surrounded by men who were not trusting in the promises of God. He was not surrounded by men and women who were being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. He was not surrounded by men and women who were beholding the glory of Christ. You know, oftentimes, when we lose our spiritual vigor, we wonder what's happened, where, what's happened to me? Why, why do I seem to be going through this state of spiritual decay or, or a loss of vigor? Oftentimes, it's because we've forgotten how to drink from the fountain of grace. It's because we've neglected God's ordinary means, such as His Word, His church, And when we neglect these means, what do we expect? What do you expect to happen? You expect for your love for the Lord to increase? Okay, I'm not in the Word. I'm not meditating upon the Word. I'm not in the Word knowing it. I'm not praying. I'm not really giving myself to the life of the church. Well, why does my Christian life seem to be stagnant or going backwards? What do you expect? 
You know, God has given us his word and he's given us one another as encouragement to press on and to keep beholding the glory of Christ who took the glorious Christ, who took our guilt and our punishment. We need one another. Because as a godly saint used to say, our forgetters get better with age. We forget. We're quick to forget. We're quick to forget these great promises that God has given to us. So let us remind one another. Let us encourage one another that in Christ Jesus, we are not condemned before God. We are commended. We are his children. We can come before the throne of grace with boldness. In Christ, your guilt is gone. Remember, for those who are in Christ, there is not one thing you can do to lose that standing. Therefore, live lives of gratitude because you've been set free to obey God's law as a rule of life, not as a covenant of works. You've been set free to delight in God's ways. You've been set free from self-love to love the one who is truly lovable. So comfort and encourage one another with these things. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you reminded that our guilt must be dealt with. We are guilty. And guilt doesn't just go away. We are guilty before you. But in Christ Jesus, our Lord, this guilt is gone. I have a hard time fathoming that. I know many have a hard time understanding that pardon gone. It's, we are pardoned. We are our sin dealt with because we still struggle with sin. Help us, O oh God. Help us to desire you, to delight in you, not in our sin. Help us to remember the very truth that we have been set free how can we still live in it? Our guilt was paid for. Why would we still want to live in the things that lead to death? Oh, help restore us to the joy of your salvation, O oh God. And help us to encourage one another. There's joy. Joy unspeakable. Remind one another of that joy. Because we all go through time whether it be because we're busy, whether because we are caught in sin, besetting sins. Father, help us to encourage one another to rebuke when necessary, but to build each other up, to encourage one another to press on, to continue beholding the glory of Christ. Help us, I pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. So at this time, if you'll stand for our benediction, I'll dismiss you with words from Romans 15, 13. So may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you may abound in hope. You're dismissed.